Often when ministers are given the responsibility of leading worship, we find it a bit challenging to worship ourselves. And that's why I feel so blessed to be in a congregation where through the reading of scripture, where through exuberant singing and beautiful anthems and a congregation that loves one another and loves Christ, it enables me to worship. And for that, I thank you. It's the second Sunday of Epiphany. Now, wait a minute, Bob. Epiphany has already happened. Remember, remember, Bob, last week, your sermon title was Yesterday was Three Kings Day. That, that was January the 6th. That was Three Kings Day. That's also known as Epiphany. That's when the church commemorates the visit of the wise men. Bob, Epiphany was last week. It's over with. Well, not quite. Because Epiphany is not just one day when we commemorate the visit of the wise men to find the Christ child in Nazareth, Bethlehem, Galilee. But Epiphany is actually a season when we focus upon turning the light upon Jesus Christ. Even last week we gave some definitions for Epiphany, if you might remember Epiphany is a revelation, it's a manifestation, it's when something which was previously unknown becomes known. Sometimes this happens very gradually as we're going to see today. Sometimes it's very dramatic and instantaneous. Aha, that's who that is. Aha, that's the name of that tune. Aha, uh -huh, that's, that's how that works. Those aha moments are epiphany moments when something previously unknown is suddenly made known. And on the church calendar, the season, not just the day, but the season of epiphany is the time when the church focuses upon Jesus Christ becoming known to the world as the Messiah, as the Savior of the world. So in Epiphany, we emphasize things like the journey of the king. We emphasize things like the baptism of Jesus. We emphasize the miracles like the changing of the water into wine at Cana. We emphasize Jesus' teaching. It's during this season of Epiphany that we look at ways that Jesus revealed himself to the world. You and I sometimes get this false impression that when Jesus Christ came into the world, when he was born, grew up, that everybody just knew he was the Messiah. Well, that's not true at all. It took a lot of people a long time to even come to recognize that he was the Son of God. For instance, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptizer, who was his cousin, even John confesses, and you can check this out in John chapter 1, the earlier part of the reading that Emma read just a few moments ago. Even John himself wasn't quite for sure who this Jesus is until as he baptized Jesus, he felt the Spirit of God saying to him, this one whom you are baptizing, he's the Lamb of God. The one upon whom you see the Spirit, the, the dove light on him, he's the Lamb of God. And and John confessed that, but evidently not a whole lot of other people knew that at that point. They only had to go on John's testimony, which he gave, as we're going to see in just a few moments, to his own disciples by saying, look, here comes Jesus. He's the Lamb of God. Now, let me ask you something. Have you ever tried to tell somebody who has no previous knowledge of Christianity or Jesus Christ, who Jesus is. You ever tried that? One minister friend of mine, whom I'll refer to a little bit later in the sermon, and whom I'll see at our minister support group meeting in a couple of weeks, tells about the time that an international student came up to him and asked him 
what is Christianism? And he said, oh, you mean what is Christianity? Well, Christianity is when God became one of us in his son Jesus Christ to manifest God's love to the world. And even when his enemies killed him, nailed him to a cross, God brought him back alive again. He was so confused. He had no idea what he was talking about. He had no previous experience with this Jesus. And so sometimes while it's true that people can have a dramatic conversion experience like the Apostle Paul did on the road to Damascus, in a lot of other cases it, it takes a while for people to come to an understanding of who Jesus is. And God tends to use a lot of different people and a lot of different events to bring people like you and me to the point where we recognize that Jesus just wasn't some good teacher or prophet. Jesus was the son of God who's alive today. And I dare say if we were to go around the room this morning and ask how it was for you when you suddenly got that aha epiphany moment that Jesus Christ was your savior, that if you would think back on that, a whole lot of different people and events might have brought you to that point. A Sunday school teacher a church family, parents, a coach, participating in youth group. God may have used many different people in many different ways to nudgingly let you know bit by bit that Jesus was not just somebody back there, but he is the savior of the world. And you reach that point, that aha moment, when you were ready to proclaim that for yourself and make your public profession of faith. But for most of us, it doesn't happen alone. God uses other people. Which is what happens today in our scripture reading. John the baptizer, who by this point knows as he's baptized Jesus, that Jesus is the Lamb of God, that he is the Messiah, but evidently other people don't quite catch this yet. John the baptizer had his own disciples, had his own followers. In fact, there were a lot of people who thought for a while that John the baptizer, John the Baptist, was the Messiah himself. But no, John was the one who was preparing the way for the Messiah, preparing the way for Jesus. And after the baptism, John realized it was his confession that Jesus was the Messiah, he was the Son of God, but not everybody got that. So a few days after the baptism, John, with some of his disciples along, sees Jesus coming and he looks at Jesus and he says to his disciples, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one we've been waiting for. Two of John's disciples, two of John's disciples decide to, to follow Jesus. And they follow him along for a while. And he turns and he says, What are you looking for? And do you recall what he says there in John chapter 1? They say, Rabbi, teacher. There were a lot of rabbis and a lot of teachers. And so at the very, very first, John's disciples are calling Jesus teacher, just a good prophetic leader. Teacher, he says, where are you staying? And Jesus utters three words which really are the three key words to doing evangelism and sharing the good news. Do you know what he says to them? Come and see. Just come and see. At this point, he doesn't quote any scripture to them. He doesn't say, this is how it is. You've got to decide right now. He just said, why don't you come and see? And so those two disciples of John go to where Jesus is staying, and they spend the day with him. And at the end of the day, he's no longer just rabbi. At the end of the day, check it out in John chapter 1, they recognize that he is the anointed one. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And one of them, who is Andrew, gets so excited that he goes and finds his brother 
And he doesn't tell his brother that, hey, something good's happened. I've just got one of those chocolate peppermint candies. No, he says, we found the Messiah. We found the Messiah. And, you know, Peter even is a little bit skeptical, but Andrew brings his brother to Jesus. And you kind of know the result. Because of Andrew's testimony, which came about because of John's testimony, Simon Peter, who was to become one of the greatest preachers and disciples of the early church, has his own confession and testimony, and it is revealed to him, there is an epiphany for him, that Jesus Christ is Lord. But that's not all. The next day, the scripture says, Jesus made a trip to Galilee, which is up north, and he finds Philip. And Philip spends some time with Jesus. And Philip comes to recognize that he's just not a rabbi, teacher. That, that he's even more than just the Messiah that people have been expecting. Philip gets so excited to say, this is the one of whom Moses spoke. This is the one that all of Holy Scripture have written about. This is the one that we've been waiting for. And Philip goes and tells his friend Nathaniel about it. Nathaniel, something great's happened. You won't believe this. But the one that we've been waiting for, the one of, of whom the scriptures speak, he's here. It, it's interesting that we find out later on that Nathaniel has been sitting under a fig tree. Back in that day and time, they only had about one-room houses, but a lot of people would plant a fig tree outside of their house, and these were trees that would grow about 15 feet tall, but they would have a shade that encompassed about 25 feet. And people would often sit under a fig tree as a place of meditation, a place of prayer, a place where they would study Scripture. And that's where Philip finds his friend Nathaniel. Hey, you might be studying scripture, but let me tell you, it's already been fulfilled. It's been fulfilled because Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth, is he. Nazareth, he says. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I don't remember anything in Holy Scriptures that says anything about Nazareth. Are, are you sure, Philip, you've, you've got this right? Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? You see, Nazareth was a little podunk town. It was close to Cana. But Cana, also a podunk town, made Nazareth look good. It was said that for 10 months out of the year, all the, all the landscape around Nazareth was just barren. You didn't want to go to Nazareth and stay. That's where you wanted to bypass and get out of there as quickly as possible. And so Nathaniel, who studied the scripture, says, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Kentucky? Can anything good come out of Kentucky? Tennessee? Can, can anything good come out of the volunteer state? Haiti? Can anything good come out of Haiti? Africa? Can anything good come out of Africa? Calvary Baptist Church, can anything good come out of Calvary? You see, in God's way of thinking, it is not where you are from that counts. It is who you are created in God's image, and regardless of your background, regardless of your race, 
regardless of your native tongue language, regardless of your place of origin, something good can come from you. Nazareth, he said. Are you sure anything good can come out of that place? And Jesus said, Nathaniel, even before Philip saw you and told you about me, I saw you. I saw you under the fig tree. I saw you meditating on scripture. And Nathaniel's saying, no, wait a minute. You, you were about a mile or two away, maybe even more. How in the world, how in the world did you see me, Jesus? And then it dawned on Nathaniel that it was impossible for Jesus to have seen him and to know that he was under a fig tree unless Jesus was, oh, epiphany moment, the Messiah. The one of whom Holy Scripture had been testifying. Do you see what's happening there in the first chapter of John's Gospel? For most of the people there who end up following Jesus Christ, it's not just one dramatic moment. It's John the baptizer coming to an understanding that this Jesus whom he's baptized is the Lamb of God. It's John telling his disciples See Jesus over there? That's the Lamb of God. It's those disciples spending some time with Jesus and recognizing that he's just not a rabbi. He's just not any teacher. He's the anointed one. He's the Messiah. And it's these people going to their friends, like Philip going to his friend Nathaniel and saying, look, all of this person you've been reading about and studying about, he's already here. Epiphany can be just a one dramatic moment, like Paul's conversion experience on the Damascus Road, no doubt. But epiphany can also be a moment that comes about because of a lot of other moments and events and activities and people that God has used to bring you to a recognition of who Jesus really is. And if you are here this morning and you can reflect back to your initial profession of faith in Jesus Christ, maybe a good exercise for you, for all of us to do during Epiphany, is to think about those people. Those teachers that home church who brought you gradually to an understanding that you were a child of God, loved by God, and who were instrumental in a pre-evangelistic way of bringing you to the moment when you made your own personal profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Oh, yeah. The minister friend that I alluded to earlier is Jim Somerville. Jim is now the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Richmond, Kentucky. He's in my Metro Minister Support Group. I'm going to get to see him, look forward to it in a couple of weeks. In a sermon he preached recently on this passage, he shared an experience about epiphany. Because epiphany, Jim said, is kind of like a dimmer switch on the wall. And you start to turn it up and it goes from barely, barely being visible to full bright. And sometimes God will use some people here, a little brighter there, and he'll dial up that switch to the point that you see Jesus in a different way. So Jim tells this 
story about the time that he was a student at Georgetown College, religion major, pre-ministerial student. He lived over a drugstore downtown, didn't live on campus. So he had this little apartment over the drugstore, and there was an office next door to the drugstore where an architect worked. And Jim sometimes could walk across the flat roof of his apartment in that drugstore and go over and tap on the window of that architect's office. And the architect would open up and, and they would have conversation. He was a most delightful person. They became good friends, but Jim said he wasn't a believer. And he made it pretty clear that they could talk about anything, and they did, except religion. That was off limits. Now, Jim is a pre-ministerial student, okay? And so that's a little tough, but, but he honors that. But they keep talking. Well, that goes on for quite a while, and it turns out that later on that Jim is called to be the pastor of a Baptist church up in Newcastle. And he's just been up there three or four weeks when he has asked and the congregation has agreed and they prayed about it that Jim's going to be ordained to the ministry. And they said, Jim, do you want to invite any family or friends to come to the ordination service? We would certainly be glad to have them. So Jim thought, I don't want to invite my architect friend. I kind of do, but I won't because we've said we wouldn't talk about religion. And You know, Newcastle's an hour and a half from Georgetown, and, but he invited him. Didn't know if he'd show up or not. Came time for Jim's ordination service, and he looked out at the congregation, and there was his friend. And Jim even said he, he kind of got squeamish every now and then when something really religious was mentioned in the service, which was quite often because he knew his friend, oh man, you just don't talk about that kind of stuff. So it came time in the ordination service for Jim to kneel. And the whole congregation, if they wanted to, was invited to come for the laying on of hands to give a blessing. And they came. And Jim, who says that normally he's not all that much of an emotional person, got very, very emotional as people that he loved, that God had used throughout his life to gradually enable him to come to an understanding, not only that Christ was Lord, but that Jim was going to follow him as a minister of the gospel. They came by and laid hands on him and blessed him. And tears came. And emotions came. And then Jim said, he came. The architect came. And he placed his hands on my friend's head. And he whispered in his ear, Jim, I don't know what any of this is all about. But Jim, I want you to know that I believe in you and I wish you the best. After the service, I went to the church fellowship hall for a time of refreshment and the architect friend sought Jim out. He said, Jim, that was powerful. And Jim said, that was real. Because Jim had dared to say, come and see. It's been perhaps a couple of decades ago 
there was a church in the Midwestern part of the United States and they were holding a kind of a business meeting. It really was a, a meeting of the officers of the church, kind of like a deacon's meeting perhaps. And the issue of the day was, was this church, their church, going to join these other churches who had come together to start a free health clinic for the migrant workers in the area. Because many of these migrant workers kind of fell through the cracks and they were just trying to make ends meet and sometimes the government aid wasn't enough and there was a lot of red tape, but they were human beings and, and they needed some health care and medical care. And so a group of churches had got together and said, we feel led of God to start a clinic for the migrant workers. But this one particular church was having a discussion about this and there were a couple of people, especially one man who said, we can't do that. Some of them might be illegal aliens and we would be participating in an illegal activity, but they're children of God, they're hurting, they need medical care. And there was almost argumentative discussion but after a while, so things didn't become too divisive, they, they decided to table that motion to participate and to take it up at another meeting. The next day, the pastor of the church called the church officer who had been most forceful against the medical clinic. He said, let's go to lunch. They went to lunch, his favorite place. They were good friends. They had a good conversation. And after lunch was over, he said, if you got a few minutes, would you, would you come with me and let, let's go down to that clinic we were talking about? He said, okay. So the pastor and, and the man walked into the clinic, into the waiting room, much like the waiting room, Mission Lexington, and they sat down just to observe. And the waiting room was full of people, older people who were sick, mothers who had brought their children to get inoculations, people who desperately needed health care. And so while they were there sitting, just waiting and observing, the door opened and a nurse came out and called for a little four-year-old boy who was there. And so he got up and he went over to the, to the door to go back into the office and he was already rubbing his arm because he knew what was coming, man, a shot. So he went in and a little while later, he came back out and he was really rubbing the arm at this point. I mean, really. And his little lower lip was, was quivering and he was trying to hold back the tears and he looked around the waiting room for his mother, but she wasn't there because she had to take a younger sibling to the restroom. And there he was hurting and crying and wondering. And all of a sudden, he saw a kind man's face and he walked over to that kind man and got up in his lap and lay his head on his shoulders. Hesitantly at first, but then compassionately and enthusiastically, that big old kind man wrapped his arms around that little boy and comforted him. And he says he could not believe the amazing sense of compassion that surged through his soul when he hugged that child of a migrant worker. It was amazing. Almost as amazing when at the next church business meeting that kind man made the motion that their church would participate in the clinic.
can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see. Come and see. Shall we pray? In so many ways, O oh God, you speak to us and you nudge us along, helping us every day to have a better understanding of, of who you are and of the people that you're calling us to be. Not just during the season of Epiphany, but throughout our lives, help us to be open to your nudges, to the aha moments to the epiphany occasions and help us God in appropriate ways not just to keep this good news of Jesus to ourselves but to share it with family and friends to dare at the right time to say come and see